the vertebral column is part of the axial skeleton, that portion of the skeleton which goes up and down the long axis of the body, which includes the skull, the vertebral column, and the thoracic cage. There are 24 individual vertebrae in the uh, vertebral uh, column, uh, seven neck vertebrae or cervical vertebrae, 12 thoracic vertebrae, which bear a pair of ribs, five lumbar uh, vertebrae, and then there are two bones composed of vertebrae which fuse, the sacrum composed of sacral vertebrae which fuse, and then the coccyx uh, composed of coccygeal vertebrae which fuse. And so we have a cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and coccygeal sections of the uh, vertebral column. Uh, the vertebral column uh, develops uh, a number of curves, so it doesn't uh, simply uh, stand straight because the weight of our bodies is mostly on the anterior side, our rib cage, etc. And so if our, our vertebral column uh, uh, was oriented uh, in this straight position in life, we would be heavy on one side and fall forward. And so therefore we um, introduce uh, curves in our uh, vertebral column to more evenly distribute uh, weight uh, on either side of the vertebral column. Before mentioning a few uh, items uh, individually about a uh, vertebrae, uh, in say what makes cervical vertebrae different from thoracic vertebrae, uh, for example, um, there are uh, features which vertebrae typically share. So for example, there is an opening which runs through the center, the vertebral foramen, just as the cranium protects the delicate neural tissue of the brain um, by surrounding it in bone. Uh, the vertebrae uh, protect the delicate uh, tissue of the spinal cord uh, by surrounding it uh, by bone. Uh, so there's the uh, vertebral uh, foramen uh, there. Uh, muscles attach to uh, the vertebrae. And so we see processes such as this single spinous uh, process uh, here, which is longest in the thoracic vertebrae, uh, or the transverse processes going out to the two lateral sides here. And if you were studying muscle attachments, you know, for example, the trapezius or latissimus dorsi, uh, you would um, learn about uh, the spinous processes, for example, where they attach. Uh, uh, all vertebrae, except for the very first one, the atlas, possess a um, body. And there are some uh, parts you might name in vertebrae which are best seen when you put multiple vertebrae uh, together. So for uh, example, here is a single vertebra, a thoracic vertebra, it turns out. Um, but notice that this is called the superior articular process and then the inferior articular process. This is because vertebrae form a vertebral column. So they articulate with the uh, vertebrae on either side of them. So here is the superior articular process, and this allows this vertebra to articulate with the vertebra superior to it. Here is the inferior articular process, allowing this vertebrae to um, articulate with the vertebra inferior to it. So these are flat surfaces, and uh, when we talk about the joints and articulations, when we flex the vertebral column or rotate uh, the vertebral column, um, there is a gliding uh, of these flat surfaces over each other. Now between the uh, bodies of neighboring vertebrae are the intervertebral discs, which, comp which uh, includes both uh, fiber cartilage and also uh, and center, a nucleus pulposus, uh, which is the remnants of the embryonic uh, notochord. Uh, this helps to cushion shock. So when we jump, it's not as if bone of vertebrae is uh, hitting a uh, bone of neighboring vertebrae. Um, but uh, the uh, forces are absorbed. Nerves leave the spinal cord and innervate you know, the arms, the legs, etc. And uh, we have vertebrae known as the intervertebral uh, I'm sorry, we have foramina known as the intervertebral uh, foramina. You can't observe this by just looking at one vertebrae. 
So notice if you just look at this one single bone, you don't see a hole here, you see a notch. It's not until you see two neighboring uh, vertebrae adjacent to each other that then you would notice uh, that there is actually a completely enclosed opening, a foramen, um, uh, through which uh, the nerves uh, would lead. So that is the intervertebral uh, foramen uh, there. And so before uh, beginning with uh, the different classes of vertebrae, once again, there are these uh, features which vertebrae in general share. You know, that uh, vertebral foramen, spinous process, transverse processes, etc. Notice here that you have nerves which are exiting between the intervertebral foramina. And once again, you would only really observe that um, when multiple vertebrae uh, are um, are adjacent to uh, each other. Uh, these nerves continue to leave through the foramina of, uh, say, uh, the sacrum. So even though it's a solid bone, it still retains the foramina from when uh, there were uh, separate uh, vertebrae which then uh, fused. So here you can see the same thing in the cervical region. Once again, the spinal cord is protected by the vertebral column. And here you see the nerves which are exiting through those intervertebral foramina here. Um, here's that intervertebral disc. Once again, there's cartilage and uh, a, a nucleus pulposus inside. And there's that intervertebral uh, foramen uh, there. Uh, so uh, we're going to begin with the cervical vertebrae in the neck. Uh, before going into the thoracic vertebrae, which bear ribs. Notice that the uh, uh, vertebrae in the lower back, the lumbar vertebrae, do not uh, bear uh, ribs before talking about uh, the uh, sacrum. So the only vertebra which lacks a, um, a body is the very first vertebra called the atlas. It's called the atlas, uh, recalling the Greek legend of a very large gentleman, you know, who held the entire world on his shoulder. Now, the uh, skull is only suspended here. There's no suspension in this region here. So it is the atlas which holds up the entire skull. The occipital condyles, they rest here. And when we shake our heads, yes, the occipital condyles are moving alongside the superior articular facets of the first vertebra, the atlas. If you're trying to you know, identify the atlas, notice that one of the two surfaces has smaller facets here. So that would be the, uh, the uh, side uh, which is inferior facing the second vertebra. It is this surface with those larger facets which are holding the occipital uh, condyles of the, uh, uh, of the skull. And here you see an interesting variation um, where you have an atlas which is actually fused to the uh, occipital bone. There are variations which occur from individual to individual. Some of us may have ribs attached to cervical uh, rib seven or cervical vertebra seven, which isn't typical. We may have extra vertebrae. We may have fused vertebrae. So just pointing out that there are variations uh, which exist. The second vertebra also has its own name. It is known as the axis and it has a process known as the odontoid process or the dens. So notice uh, that there. Now, um, I had said that the uh, atlas lacks uh, a body. Where did its body go? Because you know this section does form uh, in embryos. Well, instead of uh, fusing with the other portions of the atlas, it then attached to the second vertebra the axis. And then as a uh, result, uh, the uh, atlas without its body is free to rotate around the dens of the axis. So when we discuss joints and articulations, this will be an example of a pivot joint. Um, because once again, uh, the atlas lacking this body can now pivot, it can rotate around the dens of uh, the second vertebra, uh, the axis. And when we shake our heads, no, 
this is what is happening. The atlas is rotating around the dens of uh, the axis. And so once again, uh, when we discuss joints and articulations, we will get back to this as an example of a pivot joint. So there is the dens of vertebra number two, the axis. There's vertebra number one, which uh, articulates then with the skull. And once again, when we shake our heads, no, the atlas is rotating um, uh, around uh, the dens there. Now, the other vertebrae do not have their own names, like the atlas C1 or the atlas C2. We simply refer to the other ones as C3, C4, C5, um, C6, and C7. Um, they tend to be smaller than other vertebrae simply because they're not holding up much weight. Cervical vertebrae only have to support the head, while you know the thoracic and lumbar vertebrae are holding up the shoulders, the heart, you know, etc. So this is a smaller vertebra. Sometimes the spinous process is what is known as bifid, uh, which means it has a Y shape. So that's uh, common enough, but not universally. Uh, the case. Um, uh, the one feature which can always be used to identify the cervical vertebrae is that there is a hole in the transverse process known as the transverse foramen or the transverse foramina in plural. The reason for this is because there is uh, there are two arteries which send oxygen to the brain. The internal carotid, which is going through the carotid canal of the temporal bone, um, but then also the vertebral artery then um, passes through these transverse foramina uh, of the cervical vertebrae. So only the cervical vertebrae have these uh, transverse foramina because only the cervical vertebrae are enclosing the vertebral artery passing um, uh, uh, passing uh, through them. As one gets to the last uh, cervical vertebrae, like C6, especially then C7, um, one can uh, kind of see a transitional form looking more like a thoracic vertebra. So notice the spinous process may be elongated and uh, there may be elongations of the transverse process. Actually, if you, know, you were interested, the reason that there is that opening in the cervical vertebrae is that when we were fetuses, we did have ribs in the neck region, cervical ribs that even the most primitive egg-laying mammals still retain as a primitive uh, separate rib the way reptiles would. But what happened was the rib fused to the body of the vertebra and then became one solid bone. So as adults, we really don't see it as a vertebra and a rib, right? We just see it as one solid bone now. And then this opening is uh, where the vertebral artery passes. And then uh, some vertebrae can have uh, more extensive uh, remnants of these embryonic ribs. Um, the thoracic vertebrae are easy uh, to recognize because they have elongate spinous processes. And if you look closely, you can see worn areas or facets where the ribs attach. So thoracic vertebrae, by definition, attach ribs. There are 12 pairs of ribs and there are 12 thoracic uh, vertebrae. And so you can observe the uh, facets uh, where uh, the ribs uh, attach. Um, now, mammals underwent uh, a change so that um, um, when you look at a reptile's uh, vertebral column, um, you can see that all of uh, you know, the vertebrae are uh, bearing ribs in the neck uh, region, in the thorax, in the lower back. Um, and so uh, elongated ribs were an, uh, something that the amniotes did, but you know, there are ribs in uh, the neck. And as I said, even the uh, first mammals and egg laying mammals today still have neck ribs. We've fused those so we don't see them as separate ribs. But in addition to having ribs in the thorax, reptiles had ribs in the lumbar region as well. So in a reptile, there really isn't a separate uh, separation between a thorax and uh, an abdomen, uh, a lower back, um, because all of the ribs bear vertebrae. 
whereas mammals, um, they needed uh, to be able uh, to uh, breathe uh, more deeply because of the mammalian metabolism being warm-blooded and mammals with their larger brains needed more oxygen than those reptiles had. And so mammals needed to expand the lungs more with each breath. And so mammals lost lumbar ribs. So while uh, the you know, ancestral condition was having this, and so now are no longer lumbar uh, ribs, uh, causing uh, to become more in this um, uh, in this, so, uh, this allows uh, mammals to bring in more uh, uh, that mammals did with the column. If you were a lizard or a snake or a salamander or a crocodile, they all have a lot of side to side motion, motion the way that, say, fish swim. Whereas mammals, they then opted not to have the vertebral column move as much in this, uh, but rather to keep the vertebral column largely, largely more, almost, almost half left. So when we at the ribs of the, um, the I'm sorry, the, the vertebrae of the lower back, the lumbar vertebrae, they do not uh, bear ribs and they tend to be more robust, all right? They tend to be stouter as opposed to, you know, having elongated, you know, more elegant um, uh, spinous processes. And so this is so that uh, they bear more of the body's uh, weight. That's why they have to be thicker and stronger. Uh, and so uh, something in the lower back is bearing more weight than something in the mid thorax. And also they no longer bear uh, ribs the way they did ancestrally. Um, then uh, one, uh, uh, the remaining uh, vertebrae uh, fuse. And so while uh, we once had separate sacral vertebrae as adults, all of these have fused to become a single bone known as the sacrum. Now, why is it called the sacrum? Because that literally means the sacred bone. Well, that's odd. And the answer is we don't know. Um, maybe because it's close to reproductive organs and that reproduction was thought to be a mystical um, uh, experience. Um, maybe because it was thought that after death, individuals would then be reborn and reconstituted with all of their physical stuff so that you would look the same with the same body that you have after death as you have here. Well, to have that happen, you'd need some piece of your old body to serve as kind of like, you know, the, the, the seed from which the new body would be recreated. And since this is a compact bone, it would be a slower one to decompose. And it's, you know, guessed that maybe because it was a slower one to recompose, you know, people might have thought it is from this bone then that the rest of you uh, will be reconstituted. Well, for whatever reason, the sacrum is called the sacred bone. Uh, once again, we once had separate sacral vertebrae, but they fused because we want our legs to be able to sort, support the weight of our body. So the legs attach to the hips and the hips then <clears throat> attached to the sacrum. And so you want a strong joint here, what's called the sacroiliac joint, where the sacrum joins the ilia, uh, it, uh, the ilia of uh, the bones. And so um, we have a separate sacral uh, vertebrae fusing to form this one sacrum. Now you can still notice where you know the spinous processes of what was once the in, uh, individual vertebrae have uh, fused to make a median sacral crest, or that the um, uh, individual uh, foramina uh, uh, now have uh, fused and, and are still, or I'm sorry, they're still visible in this sacrum uh, from what was once a separate uh, vertebrae. So this is then this uh, solid sacrum, which then allows our weight, uh, the, our legs to support the weight of our bodies. Now we also then have a separate, a second bone which is made of fused individual vertebrae. We have a coccyx, uh, which in some individuals is made of three coccygeal vertebrae which fuse, um, while in others it is made uh, of five. So it varies a little bit. There are variations in the um, vertebral column. And so that, that uh, then is a second uh, fused bone. Why a uh, coccyx? Well, 
Um, the first primates did not have a uh, coccyx. And in fact, they had a prominent external tail. But more primitive primates, like monkeys, they tend to run around on all fours. And if you're running on all fours, then the weight of your urinary and pelvic organs are suspend is uh, supported by the uh, pubic bones of the hip, which then are underneath them. And so if you're going to move around on all fours, then you do have a bony support for these organs in the pelvic body cavity. But if you were to now stand upright or swing upright from branches, that's a problem, right? Because there is no bone um, in this portion of the, um, uh, of the vertebral column. So here is an old world monkey, but notice how uh, it is oriented. It is on all fours so that once again, the uh, pubic bones are supporting the weight of the pelvic organs. But there was a group that evolved from these old world monkeys, you know, or their catarine ancestors, which are known as the apes. And the defining feature of the apes, including the simplest apes, excuse me, like the gibbons you'll see here, is that they lost their external tail. They sacrificed this tail, which undoubtedly was useful for balance, um, you know, in the trees, but look at what they can do instead. Look at this gibbon hanging upright. Look at this gorilla climbing straight up a tree. You'll see another gibbon walking upright in just a second. They can do this far better than monkeys can because when they stand upright, it's not just the dermis of the skin, which is supporting the urinary and reproductive structure. So look at that gibbon. It's walking upright far better than any monkey or lemur could do. Um, and so the reason for this is if you no longer have an external tail, then the muscles which once move the tail, wag the tail, etc., can now be repurposed and form what's called a pelvic diaphragm. The pelvic diaphragm now serves as a sling for the urinary and reproductive structures, so that it's not just the dermis which is supporting the weight of these organs, it's now this sling of muscles as well that other animals would be using to wag their tails or to raise their tail, uh, etc. So apes, the defining feature of apes is that they sacrificed this external tail and converted it into a coccyx instead. And although losing a tail you know, is, is sad. I mean, because, you know, monkeys can grab things with tails, swing from their tails, and they can use it to balance. But nevertheless, this now meant that um, the muscles could be used as a, a sling. So here you see that coccyx region. So once again, look here in the pelvic region of, you know, the, the human hip here. There's no bone there. So if you didn't have a coccyx, if you were to stand upright, it would just be dermis of your skin supporting urinary and, and uh, reproductive uh, structures, uh, which isn't you know, good enough. So the fact that apes have sacrificed that external tail means that the muscles which once moved the tail can now reinforce uh, this area, uh, which allows for upright you know, swinging from trees, upright climbing, or in our case, upright walking. Also note, as I had said, the ilium, of the hip, that's one of the three bones of the hip bone, the oscoxa, then attaches to the sacrum at a joint, the sacroiliac joint. And because the sacrum is a solid bone, now the legs can strongly hold up the rest of the body because you have this big ilium attaching to this solid fused uh, bone um, uh, here. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, that uh, gives a, uh, you know, great uh, strength there. The final section of the axial skeleton is the thorax. The thorax is composed of the ribs and the sternum. The sternum can be divided into a manubrium, a body, and a xiphoid process. The xiphoid process may not ossify uh, and fuse to the body, until you know, maybe 40 years of age. So earlier in life, this is three separate bones. Later in life, the sternum is one solid uh, bone. Notice that ribs do not attach to the sternum directly, but rather through 
uh, cartilage, which is known as costal cartilages. So here, once again, you can see the manubrium and, uh, and the body. Um, if you wanted to, we could divide the ribs into groups. Uh, the true ribs, uh, ribs one through uh, seven, uh, they have cartilage which actually contacts the sternum. So the first seven ribs, their uh, costal cartilages directly contact the sternum. Uh, ribs eight, nine, and 10, their, uh, uh, their costal cartilages attach to the uh, costal cartilage of rib seven, not directly to the sternum. So they can be called false ribs. And also included in the false ribs are the last two ribs, 11 and 12, which are also called the floating ribs. They have no connection to the sternum, all right? So eight, nine, and 10 have an indirect connection to the, the sternum. So we have true ribs, one through seven. Uh, the other ones are referred to as false ribs with the last two called floating ribs uh, because they uh, do uh, not have any contact to the uh, sternum uh, whatsoever. Um, ribs have a head, a neck, and a tubercle. All right, and so um, it is the head and the tubercle which attach to the facets on the thoracic uh, vertebrae. Uh, and so uh, we have uh, these three uh, parts of the axial skeleton, the skull, the vertebral column, and the thorax. Um, in my video uh, playlist, just uh, two things once again, it's one thing for students to memorize a list of terms, but if you could make them a little, uh, the terms a little more interesting, I think the odds of remembering that increases. Um, so I have a, a silly little, you know, song talking about uh, vertebrae, uh, you know, to try to en enrich, you know, an understanding of it, like how vertebrae actually form in pieces around a notochord uh, when we are uh, embryos. Uh, you know, and I, so I, I give that and a few other you know, details about um, a vertebrae. Um, and then also, you know, just a silly little quiz, one with zombies as far as, uh, you know, which, uh, which section of the vertebral column, you know, is, is the, the zombie moving, you know, just as a way of, of quizzing yourself. Um, so that is the axial skeleton, uh, the skull and uh, the vertebral column and thorax. And then uh, the next videos will cover the appendicular skeleton.